welcome to the Conversations That Matter podcast. My name is John Harris. We have um, a few things, more than a few, to get to today. People have asked me to comment on a number of news stories, so I'm going to be talking fast. It is a lightning round, evangelical news roundup. Uh, it's it's also going to be fast because I, I only had to do this, probably could count them on one hand, maybe, maybe even just two or three fingers. Uh, where I've had to re-record a podcast because something went wrong. Well, this is one of those times. So I'm all the information's right here. But um, some things I wanted to let you know about before we get into all that. Uh, some people have asked me about this mug in particular because it's my favorite mug and it's custom made with the conversations that matter logo by Susan Payne. She is a supporter of the podcast. If you want to support a good business uh, that believes what you do. Uh, on many things, then you can go to the link in the info section. And people were wondering when I showed this last time, where can I get one? And I didn't have the link and I'm going to put it in the info section for you. So the other thing I wanted to mention is a uh, very generous uh, family in Virginia. They they uh, say they're Virginia's only organic maple syrup, or they make Virginia's only organic maple syrup. Uh, Mill Gap Farms sent me some bottles of their maple syrup. And it has Colossians 3.23 on the back, uh, Christian Company, and uh, I just appreciate so much them sending this to me. So I want you to know there's some good maple syrup out there that believes, and people that market it and, and uh, make it believe what you believe. And it's not Cracker Barrel syrup. I mean, this it's good stuff. And it'll go on your blueberry pancakes, your waffles, your French toast. I mean, look, if you live up north especially, uh, in fact, this week, you don't have to even live up north. You can live anywhere in the country, and you're wanting some some good hot chocolate, some pancakes with maple syrup, because it's cold no matter where you are. So just wanted to let you know. Um, of course, you know the farther north you get, you start calling them flapjacks. They're not pancakes anymore. They're just flapjacks. Uh, I'm not quite that far. <laughs> but uh, those are the two things I want to let you know about. Uh, one last thing that uh, concerns this podcast directly is uh, speaking. There's going to be more dates added to this calendar. In fact, today I should be starting the ball rolling on an event in Virginia, possibly Maryland, Pennsylvania. Uh, I just talked to someone else last night about another Idaho event. And uh, let's just say there's a lot going on. So I'm going to be all over the country. And I don't do this just because I you know, like to travel. I do like to travel. But um, it is a little grueling, especially when I add some more dates to this. And um, I, I do it because I really do believe that there's fruit that's born. Uh, when it, there's people that won't read the books, there's people that won't go to the conferences, there's people who uh, they're just living their lives and then they're hit upside the head by the social justice movement out of nowhere. This is m how it happens most of the time. And if, um, if I can be there at your church or your political organization, whatever it is, and uh, or someone, it doesn't have to be me, but we talk about this with you, prepare you a little bit, what to expect, how to handle it, especially from a Christian perspective, I think this really, it helps. And uh, and, and so I've been told that it, it's helped others. And uh, so that that's why I do it, is, is to help. I really think that this is a temporary thing in my life, uh, but it is something that I think is important. So um, the, the next available uh, time to, well, let me just go over the next three. So th I'm going to be in Kentucky at the end of this month, January 29th, 30th, 31st, speaking on all three days at different places in Kentucky. So the first one is in Shelbyville, Kentucky, and this is Reformation War Room. You might have seen uh, the advertisement on this podcast already, and you can go to uh, fivesolaspress.regfox.com forward slash warroom5. If that's too hard to remember, just go to worldviewconversation.com. Link is in the uh, speaking engagements uh, tab. So that's where you sign up. This is a uh, men's conference. Now, some people are asking, hey, I want to come, but I'm not a man. Well, if you want to come, uh, you can join me in Caneyville, Kentucky on January 30th uh, and RSVP information is there or January 31st in Bowling Green at the Coffee Emporium, uh, Bagels and Artisan Bakery. And I think there's going to be some of that, uh, some hors d'oeuvres uh, available there. And you can contact uh, Brian Shute, the link or the phone number and email address is right there. So those are the next three uh, dates that I'm going to be traveling and want to let you know about that. All right, let's get in to the subjects for today. We're, let me give you a brief overview. We are going to talk about uh, Grove City College. We're going to talk about Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. We're going to talk about the Southern Baptist Convention. We're going to talk a little bit about David Platt uh, and McLean Bible Church. We're going to talk about, first though, this. Now, 
Some of you recognize this, some of you don't. Written by Brian Otten, September 4th, 2019, Notes on the Evangelical Dark Web. And I included an analysis of this in my podcast. I thought it, it, there was, it undercut itself because it was asking, basically it's a, in directions to evangelical elites for how to handle people like me. <laughs> but it doesn't mention me. It mentions Christ, new Christian intellectual, uh, pulpit and pen, sovereign nations, enemies within the church. How do you deal with these people? And it gives a number of actually probably pretty helpful things. Uh, I, I don't know how ethical some of this is exactly. Uh, you want to uh, minimize, uh, it, does, it doesn't say demonize, but it's, it's usually what that kind of goes towards, minimizing your, uh, the, the, the insurgency. He, I mean, he treats this like this is, you're at war. And in some ways, I guess you are, but it, it's very um, much a, written from the perspective of someone who knows something about intelligence or is very interested in it. And that's not a coincidence, and I'll show you something in a minute. So uh, he, one of the things he says, though, is he says to basically make people like myself, uh, make us try, cite every single fact that we, when we cite a fact, make us source it every single time. Um, make sure that, uh, Let's see if I can find demand citations and evidence for every assertion. Now, of course, this whole article, though, doesn't have doesn't have citations and evidence. So that's why I said it undercuts itself. But um, there are some actually probably some advice that might have helped the evangelical elites. They didn't take most of it. Some of that happened on Twitter, but uh, it's too late now. And so here's the interesting thing, though. Brian Otten wrote this and he worked for Patrick Henry College as an adjunct professor. This is from last year, but I didn't see it till yesterday, and that's because it was being passed around on Twitter. I barely ever go on there, but I went on there for something real quick, and all of a sudden, uh, I'm seeing people sharing this around. Meet the Russiagate prober who couldn't verify anything in the Steele dossier, yet said nothing for years, March 30th, 2021. And it's a picture. And it says right on the picture, Patrick Henry College. It's Brian Otten. And I read it, and it's extremely uh, damning. It's it's just this is someone who suppressed information. I mean, he working for the FBI on uh, research teams, uh, leading them, um, allowing uh, the mistreatment of Trump's staff uh, based upon lies that he knew were lies. It's it's incredible, and it's just one of the most maddening things. And so I. I remembered, well, people online were actually remembering, and they were saying, hey, isn't that the guy that wrote this? And it's, yeah, it is the guy that wrote that. Giving directions to evangelical elites on how to handle people like yours truly, uh, and uh, yet this is the same guy caught up with the Russiagate scandal, part of the Durham probe, has to hire top lawyers to defend him right now. This is amazing. Absolutely amazing. And if this doesn't show you where the lines are, I don't know what will. Now, I don't know if he's still with Patrick Henry or not. Uh, I would assume no, but who knows? I don't know. Uh, so wanted to share that with you. I thought that was very interesting. Now, let's let's get to the meat of this. Um, we'll talk about Patrick Henry. Not Patrick Henry. We just talked about Patrick Henry. Uh, let's talk about Grove City. Grove City College, supposed to be, uh, from what I understand, not just politically conservative, but a Christian college. And um, for those who don't know, uh, I'm not going to get take you through the full history, but myself, Doug Wilson, uh, Rachel, uh, or Megan, sorry, Megan uh, Basham at the Daily Wire, and then uh, Josh Abatoy at the uh, American Reformer all have said things about what's happening there, and probably more than I'm not thinking of. Now, it was the American Reformer that started this, essentially, really before them, it was a bunch of parents who got a petition together, and um, and and so they had some demands. Um, but it wasn't starting off with, we have demands. It was very nice. It was very loving. It was, we are concerned, and we need to see a course correction because you have implicit bias training among the RAs. You have a course you're offering that pushes social justice blatantly. You have a chapel series that promotes critical race theory with a number of speakers, including those on the faculty at the college. Very concerning. Now, what happened was what typically happens. Uh, the shields go up. And I've seen this. Of course, I've been part of it at Southeastern, at Southern. Uh, they attack me. They uh, attack anything 
everything they can that they feel threatened by, but they will not actually deal with the issues. And this was no exception. Um, they, the president made a statement. It was a horrible statement. I went over it. It just did not deal with the issues. It vilified the parents. And it was shameful. And then, of course, uh, Carl Truman comes out, and then he tries to, uh, I, I don't even know what to say about this. I did a podcast that was almost an hour, I think, on it. But either he doesn't know what's happening on his own campus, or he does know, and he's covering for him, and he's engaging in what seems to be a level of, I, I don't even know what to say, because I don't want to call the guy dishonest, but that I, I don't know how else, it, <laughs> how do you categorize it? It just, uh, it, it's, if he knows what's truly going on, and then he minimizes it, moves the goalposts, and uh, excuses it. And it, it just, it, it's a, it was bad. It was really bad. And so this is what they typically do, though, so I wasn't very surprised. Now, the thing that it was different, there's two things different about this I want you to think about. And when we get into Southeastern, I'll talk about it some more. Number one, the American Reformer and the Daily Wire went after uh, them. Uh, and not not in a mean way. It was, again, the whole intention of everyone has been to see a course correction. Those preventing it are those putting up the shield and saying, oh, nothing to see here, or uh, you're being mean, or trying to deflect. Deflect, disguise, deny. That's that's kind of the, that's, that's the pattern. That's what we, we always see, deflect, disguise, deny. Now, I don't think, it, it, they, someone like a Doug Wilson, someone like myself, uh, they can just ignore us. Now, not truly ignore us because they have to mention us. They, they have to say discernment bloggers or they have to say something about the voices online and you know, you know who they're talking about, but they, they won't give us the dignity of mentioning who we are. Once you get the Daily Wire in there though, they don't have that luxury anymore. They have to kind of acknowledge it and it's because the pressure's coming from very much outside. Uh, it's not in... It's it's more it could be read by people in their circles, and this is one of the points I've tried to make about elites. It doesn't really hit them hard until it affects their social circles, and this is I think what it's the tragedy of what's been happening at Southeastern and Southern is. My intention has always been, and and others uh, from the beginning has always been, we we actually love the Southern Baptist Convention. We love look. I graduated from Southeastern. I, I love the institution. I've said that all along the way from the beginning. Here's some information, and the the hope was that they would course correct, and if not, that this would eventually be picked up by more conservative uh, voices with some influence in the SBC. It would eventually be picked up, if not by them, by political conservative outlets like the Daily Wire, that kind of thing. It doesn't happen, though. It doesn't happen in the SBC. I want you to hold this, this thought and wonder. think to yourself, why is that? I have some ideas on why that might be, but think to yourself about it. Back to Grove City. So uh, then there's a podcast that comes out, uh, the Anchored Podcast, and they have uh, Megan Bashan, Lee Wishing, Carl Truman on the podcast to talk about Grove City. And this was very eye-opening and interesting. If you have an hour of time and you're interested in it, um, Lee Wishing, uh, I believe that's who I was listening, that's what it says on the, the podcast title here, but he uh, is, couldn't give specifics about what was happening at Grove City, uh, very offended, uh, by what he calls, really, he actually used the word, I think, appalled, about people who were writing in and treating image bearers of God in horrible ways, hate mail, this kind of thing. So people who spoke on the during the Critical Race Theory series, they didn't call it that, but in the aftermath of the Floyd incident and all of that, uh, he's appalled that he's getting uh, the kinds of emails he is. And, and so this is a, an attempt, in my mind, to kind of deflect from the issue, because he really goes on about this. And, and it doesn't offend him nearly. He doesn't seem as concerned that critical race theory is being taught, has been taught, uh, without any kind of qualification on campus. Yet he's very offended that people outside the campus, that he doesn't actually have any purview or authorization or uh, influence over, are writing in and saying apparently nasty things. He won't share what they are about people that are pushing this stuff. This is typical in my mind. This is, this is, it is, it's all about fashion and optics and style and tone and uh, winsomeness and caution and uh, quote unquote respect. Um, but where is truth in all of this? That's the question, right? When you're way more offended about people you can't control 
who are saying things that offend you because that's my colleague and he, you know, you shouldn't be up so angry and upset at him for teaching critical race theory stuff instead of getting upset that critical race theory was taught here. So you saw that, you saw, you know, he kept repeating, we're staying true to our Christian foundation and really just a lot of, a wall of words, a lot of taking air out of the room, a lot, I don't know why, if it was a stall thing or if it was just nervousness, but very, a lot of repetition. And then Carl Truman um, tries to introduce us to the possibility of maybe they're, you know, the teaching critical race theory uh, course, uh, maybe that's just teaching the uh, critical race theory you know, as a not not teaching it, but teaching about it, right? This is a defense I've seen many times before too. You know, we're you know we have to read the Communist Manifesto, but uh, we're not communists. Well, of course, but the problem is that's the, the whole issue from the beginning was not teaching about it; it was teaching it. And then he tries to baptize the motives of uh, the Chapel series that push critical race theory and invited Jamar Tisby by, well, you know, it's worth taking risks to talk about race. You know, we, we, we might make some mistakes, but it's worth taking the risk. Really? Worth taking the risk? Does, does he understand what this stuff does? What it actually, at the root level, implies? And we'll talk about it as we get into this more, because I have an opportunity, I think, at the end to talk about this. But um, the root issues are not being discussed. And then... Um, the context seems to justify what Grove City did. Well, everyone was questioning about the Floyd incident. Everyone was, in fact, uh, Lee Wishing even talks about, you know, well, I, you know, I'm concerned about systemic racism, uh, or maybe it was the host. I think it was the host said that, the host of the program. Uh, and, you know, here's, here's the thing, though, that, that I would want to say to Carl Truman is not everyone was doing that. Not everyone was doing that. I wasn't doing that. A lot of people listening to this program weren't doing that. I don't think half the country was doing that. Uh, we, we weren't sitting around thinking like, oh, maybe, maybe the police are systemically racist. Maybe, maybe that's just characterizes them. If you're a police officer, that's what you are. You know, maybe, maybe that is fundamental to what America is. All, every region of America. Uh, and we need to take down historical monuments. Uh, and not, not just the ones in the South, but uh, the ones to Lincoln and Columbus and uh, some, some of the past presidents like McKinley and... Uh, some of the missions out in California. I mean, maybe that's really what America is. It's just systemically racist. And no, uh, half of us weren't saying that, in fact. Um, so th there's, it's very concerning to me that Carl Truman tries to go down this line and he says some very true things. But like Carl Truman, I've said this many times, he's very good in the abstract. And then when it gets concrete and the closer it gets to him, uh, the closer the proximity, it just, it's like the wheels come off. And I, I don't quite understand it. He can describe what wokeness is in the interview. Uh, he can uh, articulate why we should be concerned about it, and then the wheels come off. And I think Megan Bashan did an excellent job trying to keep things on track and catching them in all, all the kinds of deflect, disguise, deny um, uh, mode, things that they tried to do. Now, one of the things you'll notice about this, would we, you know, would this kind of thing ever happen? Would there ever be like, we got to do damage control, uh, you know, get A.D. Robles and uh, J.D. Hall on a roundtable discussion. No, it wouldn't. And, and that's my point. One of my points I'm trying to make is that the pressure came from a, a, a social circle in which they want to have some measure of clout and respect. Uh, they, they respect Megan Basham and the Daily Wire to some extent. And so they, they can't, they, they have to try to clean this up. Well, after that, uh, this happened. Grove City College's supposed wokeness. National Review. Horrible article. Just terrible article. Basically, the long and short of it is, uh, hey, uh, conservatives who are concerned about what's going on at Grove City, they don't believe in freedom of speech. That's my summary, my 30,000-foot view of that article. Megan Bashan had a very good analysis of this, and she says, having reported on the dust up at Grove City, I can tell you this essay at National Review is disturbingly disingenuous, and she gets into all the details of why, and she's 100% correct on all of them. I'm very impressed with how she's handled this. Because uh, I, I can't imagine, there was probably some pressure on her. Uh, I, I understand what that pressure is. But you have the Daily Wire and the National Review now contradicting each other. If you think there's a war in Christianity, there's also a war in political conservatism. It's fractured, and fracturing is bad. Once you're fractured, an all-powerful globalist uh, government is very capable of doing all kinds of things. And so um, I, it does, well... National Reviews was plain wrong on this, and they need to be called out for it, but it's, it is disturbing that you're seeing 
these conservative, quote unquote, conservative organizations kind of splitting off. And I, I don't, National Review is just, I don't even know what to say about it anymore. It's, it's not, it's not worth, not worth the, uh, the ink that, <laughs> that, that, that it's printed, the paper it's printed on. I just don't even, I used to, the thing is, I used to actually get it years ago and uh, I stopped and um, now I'm, I'm just so disappointed with the direction of it. Anyway, here's what I think, and, and Doug Wilson made this point first. So I, I think this is what they could do. Crown College leader pushes to display torn down controversial statues, okay? Monuments that have been torn down. And of, of course, in the article, they're saying, let me see if I can find it. Um, there's a whole thing here. Uh, here it is. Uh, you know, Dr. Sexton at this particular college would include Nathan Bedford Forrest, because it's in Tennessee. Nathan Bedford Forrest was taken down from Memphis. Uh, and his graves, and his grave and his wife's grave were dug up. And he, he was a Confederate general, and he defended the city of Memphis, and they literally dug up his graves. And so uh, Dr. Sexton at Crown uh, College says, you know, we'll take it. We'll, we'll take any of these statues. And, of course, the media says, well, you know, Nathan Bedford Forrest, the former leader of the Ku Klux Klan who enslaved black Americans and killed Union soldiers during the Civil War. That's the only thing they have to say about him. And, of course, it shows, that, guys, I just want to make this point to you. Even on things you don't know about, you haven't read books on, you just it's, it's almost good to start off. It, no, it is good. Start off with this assumption anytime you're dealing with the media at this point. I'm, I'm just, I'm serious. Assume they're lying to you. <laughs> Assume they're lying. They're giving you half-truths. They're not giving you the full picture because they're doing it here. They're doing it here, and they do it all the time. They, it, they're pushing an agenda all the time. Anyone who studied Nathan Bedford Forrest, even, even a very slight study of Nathan Bedford Forrest, reveals the fact He's the one that called for the end of the Ku Klux Klan. He was an early civil rights leader in Memphis, kissed a black lady on the cheek, and pushed for uh, political equality, quote unquote, at the time, which meant basically that they should have the right to vote. They should have the same kinds of uh, rights that everyone else does in Memphis. Yes, Confederate general. His slaves were his cavalry. He freed them. They were some of the most notorious uh, and feared uh, uh, units in the entire war. And if you want to talk about he killed, he killed northern soldiers, guess who killed more of them? His slaves. <laughs> and after the war, former slaves sharecropped on his land and loved him. There was one uh, story about a slave who tried to uh, basically get Forrest in trouble and claim that he was abusing him and all this stuff. And it was the, it was the people, the former slaves that worked his um, uh, sharecropped with him and stuff. They, they, and the people that lived around him all knew it was an absolute lie. They all defended him because they knew the character he had. He converted to Christianity. This is not someone that is you can paint with just the one color. And so uh, this is what they're doing. And they're trying to ring, put that around the neck of uh, Dr. Clarence Sexton. But I, I'll tell you what, I don't think it's going to work. And I think it's actually going to really work in favor of Crown College because you know what? This is a bold move. And if you're going to send your kids to college, I don't know much about Crown College, but do you want to send them to Grove City where they just deflect, the sky denies the wokeness? Um, I happen to know one thing. I will say this about Grove City real quick. They are inviting someone to chapel who is the opposite of wokeness and social justice. And I don't know if it's to do more shielding, if it's to deflect, if it, I don't know if, it's, if that's the motive or they legitimately want to provide a countervailing voice but it should concern you it took all this pressure and time to get it done and it's one you know one voice to come in um, I mean they should be doing series against social justice knowing that you know it's like being in Mormon country and like having a bunch of Mormon speakers show up at your Christian college and push Mormonism and you don't ever lift a finger to oppose it until uh, the rest of the country and the parents sending their children start raising the roof about it so would you rather send your kids there or would you rather send them to Crown College where they're saying, yeah, <laughs> we'll have a monument garden. We'll take these stats. We're, we're against social justice. I mean, what proves that you're against social justice? Your words or your actions? And I, I say Crown College is leading the way on this and Grove City should be doing this. That, and Doug Wilson suggested it. Why don't they do a monument? They could call it the diversity garden because you'd have, you'd have Union and Confederate soldiers, explorers, presidents. Uh, you'd have all kinds of people, a diverse array of people that have been canceled. Why don't you do that? And I agree with Doug Wilson on that. But guess what? Most modern conservatives don't have the guts, and if they even are conservative, or uh, or or the understanding to be able to even do something like that. We we're, we lack leadership. We lack courage. Um, 
And when people are afraid of being called names and they want to be liked, especially by the left. And that is what keeps moving the Overton window left, left, left. To the point now, you have some of the January 6 folks, uh, when the FBI raids their house, taking copies of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence in for evidence of extremism. Yes, that's where we're heading. And it's because of courageous conservatives, in my opinion, <laughs> supposedly, who keep uh, kowtowing to the left. I would send my kids to Crown College before Grove City any day of the week at this point. Now, um, that doesn't mean Grove City can't course correct, and we should pray for them that they do, because uh, it's been embarrassing the way they've handled this so far. It should be an admission of we goofed. There's been some, some bad things that have happened here, and this is what we're doing. Our actions are showing what we are going to do to course correct, and maybe that will still happen. Now, let's get to uh, another college now. This is Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, where I graduated from. And we're going to talk a little bit about why the pressure on Southeastern has been different. The reaction has been different than the pressure on Grove City. Um, I've known about this information now for a little while. And uh, so, so I don't, I, I just say that to let you know that I, I've seen the primary sources on this. It's not just because of these blogs, Capstone Report or Reformation Charlotte, where they've organized some of this. I, I actually do have the actual uh, emails and everything that they're citing here. Um, but this is where you can go to find it online if you want to go find it. SBC Seminary requires uh, missions trips to graduate and all valid trips require proof of vaccination. Uh, by the way, the SBC convention in California looks like it's kind of going that direction as well. But, um, but Southeastern is put out a policy, and they're just completely giving in to the quote-unquote OSHA requirements that are illegal that Biden, the Biden administration is handing down that have not even gone through the court system yet. But Southeastern is going along with it. And so you have to get regular testing if you're an employee and don't want to get the jab. And you, uh, otherwise you have to get the jab and you have to wear a mask if you're not going to do that. And you have to report your status. I mean, talk about draconian. And then you have uh, the, I guess this is the, uh, I don't know, vice president or something uh, of the institution uh, emailing the student body. This is the students. Encouraging them all to get the jab and mocking those who have concerns. You know, he says, I've been fully vaccinated at this point. This is Ryan Hutchinson. Uh, the executive vice president. On a positive uh, positive note, I've started to regrow hair in my head, although it's a glow in the dark green color. I, and he goes on about this. You know, he's got uh, like an extra, his right foot accommodates an extra toe. The, Google tells me this is temporary. There's nothing to worry about. He's mocking the people who say that the vaccine has issues. And let me tell you, every day the evidence mounts more and more and more. You want to help grandma? You want to stop the, the spread? then maybe the best thing to do is not to get this because the people getting this, it's proven now, are the ones that are susceptible to getting the variant and spreading the variant. So there you go. Uh, that's Southeastern. And then, of course, Reformation Charlotte did this last month. Uh, more proof critical race theory is being taught at the seminary. And I, I've said this for a while. It just went underground. It, they, they didn't stop. Matt Mullins, Walter Strickland, they, these guys, they never stopped pushing their either critical race stuff or liberation theology, it just went underground. And and so you can see that uh, this is, I guess, fairly recent. Within the last year or two, uh, you have the invention of whiteness, Unit 2, and I think this is American literature, if I remember correctly. I have the source of this. Um, but it's a link to, there's a, there's a link to a video um, called The Changing of the Gods, The Invention of Whiteness, uh, by John A. Powell, professor of law, UC Berkeley. And yes, if you watch it, the, the whole premise of the video is that really no one ever thought of race. Race was never, it was it's complete social construct. No one thought of it until a bunch of elites got together and said, you know how we can really oppress people? We got to divide them along race. And then if we divide them along race, they're easier to control. And uh, you know, the history of, if you want to talk about the concept of race and the history of it and stuff, and the term itself and where it originated, uh, sure, I, I'll give you during colonization when Europeans started exploring the world, they noticed people were different. I mean, hey, some tribes had polygamous relationships. They didn't have the same technology. Uh, there was cannibalism. There was all kinds of things that, uh, and sometimes horrific. Read, I just read um, Of Plymouth Plantation, William Bradford. And some of the things described that the natives would do some, not, not every tribe, but the ones that they were familiar with and that William Bradford was writing about were horrific, absolutely horrific. Just the worst kind of torture you can imagine. And 
uh, anyway, uh, this, this kind of thing didn't really give Europeans the impression that they were arriving and encountering a civilization that had advanced more than they had. Uh, they saw their technology and their economy, the way they um, uh, arranged their civilization, and they saw room for improvement. Doesn't mean that there were some things that uh, the natives, uh, depending on the tribe, may have had or things they may have valued that were superior to the Europeans. I'm sure there, def there definitely were. But, uh, but the concept, if you want to talk about the concept of race, you're seeing not just an ethnic group, you're seeing uh, religion, you're seeing culture, uh, all kinds of habits that informed by the region they were in. There, there's, there's all kinds of streams running into this, this, uh, this lake. And, and they saw that and they thought, this is, this is different. This is different than, and we, we need to account for this. How, what is, is it Christianity? What is it? And I'd say for, for a lot of Europeans, it was. That's why uh, they sent in missionaries. And they, I mean, Christianity was uh, the, the element that made sense. That was the missing element, the fundamental thing that, uh, now when you have the proto-Darwinists come along and scientific racists who are genetic determinists, they start saying, no, it's not, it's not religion. It's, it's their genetics. That's what makes sense of uh, the state of affairs. And critical race theorists, though, want to, they want to act like um, it was, no one ever thought of, of race until some people wanted to use it for power. Some elites wanted to use it to control. And then they started categorizing people by this. No, it just kind of naturally occurred as observations were made, as people interacted. And, and that's the thing that they're missing. And ideology tends to do this. Uh, ideologues, uh, everything's abstract. They can't. They don't have room for organic um, uh, development. So uh, that's what's happening at Southeastern now. Um, now, now, this is the question I have for everyone: Why? Why uh, the pressure on Southeastern? Why has it not worked as much? What's the difference between Southeastern and Grove City? Grove City. Uh, this all happened very quickly. You had parents got involved, you had parents petition. So you had pressure from the, what I would say is the bottom up, okay? Then you had pressure from the top down. Uh, not with, so I shouldn't say the top down. Let's say, we'll, we'll say outside. So you had pressure from the bottom up, parents, students, pressure from the outside. And, uh, and they did, thought, they, we need to respond. We need to do something. And so they come out and they start responding. With Southeastern, it was different. You did not have pressure from the, uh, the bottom up. You didn't have parents. There, there's a few here and there, but there was never any organizational attempt. And that's one of the things that is different about the SBC. When you're in that guild, there is an unspoken hierarchy. You are not supposed to rattle that cage. It's not the local church. It's not the hierarchy you see in scripture. It is the SBC machine hierarchy. Um, I've faced this firsthand. Uh, what, hey, what, pa parents even contact me, or more often than not, students. Uh, I remember one time there was like 10 students or something like that there. Wanted to, one of them had a great idea, you know, let's make a petition, let's really, and, and I, I thought, great, let's support this. And uh, there's, there's, there's a hesitancy. When you get to the edge of the cliff to jump, it's, you're so hesitant because am I going to uh, bring disrepute upon this institution. And there's there's a loyalty to the institution that people that go to Grove City, I don't think, un, they, they don't have that as much. Uh, there's more of a loyalty to truth and to their, their principles and uh, their families or the communities of their country. And in the SBC, there's a, there's a different loyalty that trumps those things uh, sometimes in some situations. So, um, so you have that. And then you also have the fact that Outside political organizations, if they were interested, I've been told on good authority by people that I trust to some extent, at least, uh, that you get the call from someone like an Al Mohler. I've also been told Danny Aiken does this. He'll, he'll, you, you'll get the call uh, preemptively, um, even if some if they find out you're thinking about, uh, you're, you're upset or any, anything. The wine and dine strategy comes out. There's a big incentive to not, not go that direction, not you know, rattle the cage, not disrupt things too much. And so uh, they have a larger network, there's more money there. Uh, and uh, there's, there's 
let's just say more of an incentive not not to disrupt that and to make an enemy of this entire group of Christians because that's the threat. Now the reality is you're not doing that. It's just the elites, <laughs> but that's that's what you think is going to happen. So um, so that's one of the things I think. So you don't have there's two kinds of pressure being brought to Brown Grove City that are not being brought to, on Southeastern and they need to be, frankly, they need to be. I don't know how to make that happen. And it's not something that is within, it, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk about it more at the end uh, when we talk about the Southern Baptist Convention as a whole. But uh, that's, I think, the, the major difference. And they're a lot more impervious to outside uh, forces as well because they, their feeder, feeder churches are within their network that send them students. And at this point, Southeastern's got a niche. I mean, it's known to be more of the social justice school. And so uh, it's, you're going to get people who are of that mentality coming to the school. And if you change that image too much, you, you won't get them coming now. So uh, I think there's a number of reasons that this is the case, why things at Southeastern and other Southern Baptist schools have not worked in the same way that things seem to be working a little more at Grove City. Though we'll know more in time. Now let's talk about the, uh, before we get to the SBC in general, let's talk about this. Uh, David Platt, some things floating around there online. He is speaking at the Exiles in Babylon, which is a Preston Sprinkle conference. And for those who don't know, Preston Sprinkle, an advocate for the uh, homosexual orientation variety of Christianity, this the celibate gay thing. You have Jackie Hill Perry there who's moved, I guess, in that direction. And Greg Coles, of course, I did a review of his book, a uh, terrible book, also um, in, in that same vein, uh, as well as I, I'm sure a number of others I'm not recognizing here. But you have Durham Gray, Thibidi, and Abuile, both very social justice minded. And there's David Platt. And, and so uh, people were pointing this out that, look, David Platt, is showing where he's at. He, he's willing to speak at a conference that is organized by Preston Sprinkle. Now, this is further, um, let's just say, vindicated, I guess, that view that David Platt is moving in that direction by this. Now, this, you can see, is from McLean Bible Church. That is the channel that this particular video appears on. Let me play this for you. This is David Platt's church, McLean Bible Church. And uh, I guess this is one of his associate pastors. Uh, let's hear what it has to say. How do I love my transgender neighbor? Hey, what's going on? My name is Eric Saunders, and I'm a pastor here at McLean Bible. And my question today is this. How do I love my transgender neighbor? See, Jesus is the ultimate hope. And in Jesus, our transgender neighbors find a friend closer than anyone else. You see, we have a God who has not left us alone. We have a Savior, Jesus, who has experienced the ultimate feeling of not belonging in his body. 1 Peter 2.24 says this about Jesus. It says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Uh, I want you to think about this. Jesus, the sinless and holy son of God, perfect in all of his ways, he bore our sins in his body. And in doing this, listen, Jesus experienced something completely foreign to his, to his understanding of who he is. What did he experience? The holy son of God experienced sin in that moment. You could say in that moment that he experienced a kind of dysphoria. And he did that for what? For us. Well, that was very cringe, and uh, I'm not sure it requires a lot of commentary. So that's part of what's happening at McLean or McLean Bible Church. If you go to Reformation Charlotte, uh, that's where I saw the, the link initially. You can see the whole video. It's like six minutes long. But uh, Jesus apparently ex experienced some dysphoria, according to a pastor there. Now, uh, these are some of the goofy things, of course, going on uh, every day now in formerly what used to be called evangelicalism. I want to talk about something that I consider to be very positive and um, where there, there's positive and negative in this podcast. All right. So we, we've talked about some negative things. We've talked about some positive things, positive, the pressure, the, you know, if Grove City College does the right thing, if this 
if this works and they truly do repent and they course correct, that gives so much hope to other colleges, okay? Uh, and and I, I see more progress in a very short period of time with Grove City. Now, I don't know that they're going to come out of the woods, but I see more progress than in years at Southeastern. So we can, we can look at that as a positive. Um, so negative, obviously, Southeastern is still going down the, a bad track. Negative, of course, uh, what's happening at McLean uh, is they're, they're going down a bad track continuing to it, it's um it, it some of the things that have happened there on the local church level are just very uh shocking in my mind some of the things that have haven't even really made it to the uh, public yet but things that um uh, i've seen and, and some some of them i've been told from people who attend there it's just it's amazing to me uh the, the legal action that's taking place right now it's just uh, how do you get there? And David Platt's still going and he's speaking and, and some of the conferences he's speaking at seem to uh, be very much in favor of some kind of a same-sex attracted orientation Christianity. So that's a negative. When it comes to the Southern Baptist Convention as a whole, I want to give you something very positive, but it's, it's, with, it's, it's with some sorrow. So I want to set this up. It's very positive in my mind that people, 30,000 foot view here, it's very positive that some con more conservative minded people, more orthodox minded people, let's use that word, are seeing that there's a problem in the SBC and they don't want to fund that and they're leaving. It's a sorrow, it, it's very sad to me that it took this long and the resources that were used to try to reclaim the denomination and how they were managed and just how everything was strung out. Um, and then the conservatives haven't, they, they didn't really win much. They, any, they didn't win anything really. Uh, that's sad to me. So I see a positive and a negative here. And I'm going to talk more about that. I know there's some people that are listening who just should have gotten out of the SBC a long time ago. There's some listening that still want to stay in and fight, and I'm going to navigate that a little bit with you. I want to do it, though, by starting off with this. This is a, uh, a blog, and for those who don't know who Josh Bice is, Josh Bice wrote this. He's the founder of the G3 Conference. Why We Are No Longer an SBC Church, a statement by Josh Bice. And you can go read it at the G3 blog, and a lot of it focuses on, in fact, if I did a keyword search, gospel, 10 times the word gospel comes up. And it uh, talks about basically social justice being a false gospel. Now, I don't see in this where he explains why that is. Um, I usually explain that they there's an attempt to merge works of social justice with grace. And it's very parallel to the Galatian heresy. I don't see an explanation. It's just more of a, uh, just it, it's just a statement that he makes that um, th that there is this false social justice gospel. Uh and, you know, a lot, there's, I mean, this isn't an in-depth article. I don't think it's meant to be. Um, he points out some of the hypocrisy from the SBC, uh, like years ago, boycotting Disney, but they're not willing to boycott Derek Bell or Kimberly Crenshaw, that, these kinds of things. Um, focuses a bit, I think, on the complementarian stuff. And, you know, we're getting out because of social justice. In fact, I think that's the hashtag up here, social justice. And Josh Bice has um, a, a G3, a network of churches that he is trying to get together. I don't know how loose or it is. I, I'm not overly familiar with it. But my understanding is you do need to subscribe to the London Baptist Confession, Confession 1689. And um, this means that it would be limited to people who are more uh, Calvinist. Uh, I, I suppose that would probably mean they would be more covenantal in their theology as well. So this isn't the whole Southern Baptist Convention uh, that would be candidates for, for this network. This would be specific to 1689 Baptists. And, uh, and that's fine. It's, uh, you know, hopefully that's a good thing. I think um, part of me, I, I'm torn on this. There needs to be organization. There needs to be local church autonomy and organization. I think that's what probably is trying to be balanced even here. Uh, I mean, not, look, I helped create discerningchristians.com. Uh, and so you can go and you can look at churches in your area that aren't on the social justice train. And it's a very broad statement of faith. And it includes even Pentecostals. I mean, it's it's very broad. And I let people know that. It's 
it's Calvinists, it's Pentecostals, it's there's Charismatics in there, there's Arminians, it's uh, I'm sure Wesleyans and Methodists, but it, it just it's it's a starting point and to to help someone find a church that just isn't on that bandwagon, uh, and we're trying to customize that according to denomination as well. Uh, and so it's just a tool. That's all it is. It's not a network. It's a tool. Um, I think what Josh Bice is doing is probably forming more of a network, a G3 network for uh, specifically 1689 uh, Baptist folks. And and so I have um, I have a few thoughts on this. I, I just I, I want to use this kind of moment uh, as a opportunity to just look back and and. and analyze kind of what's happened over the last few years. There's some bad and there's some good in the way that things have been handled in the SBC. And I don't know that you know, maybe this could be used as a model for others who are fighting similar battles of what not to do and maybe what to do. Um, there was an effort early on to try, and this is among more orthodox conservative type folks, to separate themselves from quote-unquote fundamentalists. I saw it. I remember it. And I don't want to question anyone's motive, but we're all fundamentalists now, okay? There's no way to escape, really, the pejoratives the left is going to throw at you. You can try to run all day long, and you can separate yourselves from all, all the bad guys in your mind, uh, the quote-unquote discernment bloggers, the, w whatever. The left is going to come after you, no matter what. Uh, of course, they'll go for low-hanging fruit, but they'll go. F it doesn't really matter. They'll go for you if you stand in their way, even a little bit, even a little bit. And there was, there seemed to be an effort to soft, kind of ally with, try to find common cause with, reason with people more to the left and distance oneself from those to the right among conservatives. And I, I, I saw this, I still see this. And I think it's a very bad tactic. What it does, it's, it's moved the Overton window. And we can see that the SBC is a great example of this. It has moved the Overton window so far in the SBC that you can have a guy who's the president who is a plagiarizer, serial plagiarizer, and it's justified because, let's be honest, because he's got the right political views. You can have the entire board kind of basically kamikaze themselves uh, with denying attorney-client uh, privilege. And it's okay because it's for this higher purpose of me too and church too. Reason has gone out the door in the SBC. There is a false gospel being cranked out of, in some quarters of, of these seminaries. It's been promoted uh, with the North American Mission Board. And it's very serious. The sense of proportion, I think, was, was very off. And some of that is ignorance. I'm not, qu I'm not naming anyone. I'm not questioning anyone. I'm, I'm saying that there, there was kind of a, a loose group of some who could see the problem, but they, there's this desire still to kind of, and I get it, try to, to be reasonable with and liked in some way, at least work with those who had some kind of power in the denomination and evangelicalism in general. And if you could get brownie points by kind of distancing yourself or throwing overboard someone who was more to the right or more quote-unquote fundamentalist then I, I did I did see examples of that happening and I think it moved the Overton window left I think it, it it just set in stone a precedent that we are acceptable on the left those to the right are not acceptable and then they kept shifting it the goalposts kept moving uh, we had a window we had a window I think from 2000 18. It should have been really before that. It should have been probably 2016 to 17. Some people did know what was going on, but I'll, I'll just put it at the point in which I saw it going public. 2018, the uh, MLK 50 conference should have been it. 
and then the TD4G right after that, that should have been the time right then, 2018, got to do something now. This is wrong. Let's go after it. We don't want to, this is the moment of you need to repent of your false teaching, not the moment of, uh, well, you're still brothers and we really want to reinforce the relationship with you that you're brothers. Should have, That should have been the moment. And the window I think extended probably to 2020. I'm going to say the, uh, let's say the statement that Southern Baptists made after the George Floyd incident. That, that was a window. Now, I've somewhat, I've extended it on this program to 2021 because there wasn't a Southern Baptist convention in 2020. I really did think that that was the end of the window was 2020 because you let the rock go for so long. You teach it in the seminaries for so long. You just, it becomes overwhelming. You can't let the rot continue. It doesn't take that long, but it, if you get, you know, five years, because by the time it was, people understood what was happening in 2018, I could see that it had been happening years before that. I saw how the sausage was made. I was at, I was at Southeastern. I was wondering in 2017, is anyone going to say anything? And in 2018, I was glad that finally this was more public. And some people like James White were starting to say things. But before that, who, who was saying anything? Pulpit and pen? Uh, I don't know. Uh, there, there weren't many, at least publicly. Okay, there were probably whispers and things behind the scenes, but publicly, it was it was outlets like pulpit and pen, and they, you know, they were mocked and ridiculed, and um, and, and maybe there's things you disagree with the way they handled it. My only point is, they were almost the only game in town, up to a point, talking about any of this. Uh, and so you had a window and last ditch effort I thought would have been the convention in 2021 since it was canceled in 2020. And that was the moment conservatives were defeated. And I know uh, some on the, who want to look at that very positively think, well, we almost won. Yeah. That was probably though, based on the circumstances of where it was, uh, and the fact that in Anaheim, they're probably going to have, you know, requirements as far as masks and vaccines, and it's not typically a conservative area anyway. Uh, SBC's bleeding conservative churches. If you think you're going to have a better showing of conservatives in Anaheim, I, I don't know what, I, I could sell you the Golden Gate. I, I don't know what to say. I don't see the leadership. I don't see the rallying cry. I don't, I don't see it. Uh, I think it was, that was probably the last moment where you could have maybe done anything. And just because you captured the presidency wouldn't have meant, you, oh, it's all saved at this point. I think we've seen that with national elections enough. Um, now with everything going on in the executive committee, it just, it's, I don't know. There's no way short of God does a miracle and just revives the hearts and minds of people. There, there's nothing that can be done from a political human standpoint that I can see. I don't see a solution politically there in the SBC. And so... Some of the strategies, these are broad overviews, but trying to separate oneself from the extremists, right? The fund, and it's, a, again, a moving bar. Uh, FBI is taking copies of the Constitution into evidence for people that were at January 6th. They're extremists. They have the Constitution on them. This is, <laughs> look at where this is going. Look at where this is going. So separating from the fundamentalists, bad move. Uh, it's actually, it's almost ironic because it is kind of like we're separating from the separatists. But uh, the other thing is um, the issues that conservatives wanted to fight. And I'm talking about any anyone with any institutional kind of influence in the SBC. The, the issues they seemed to want to fight were pragmatism and complementarianism. You know, it's just, this is all pragmatism. It's all pragmatism. And I, and I pointed out before, there is a pragmatic element here, but at the root of it, this is a different religion. This isn't pragmatism. This is, pragmatism might be causing some people to go along with it when they wouldn't normally out of ignorance, but pragmatism puts a very innocent face on the whole thing. It, it uh, is a way to complain about what's happening in the SBC I'm not saying it's just that, but one, one of the things it is, is a way to complain about things that are happening in the SBC without questioning people's motives as much. So let me give you an example. If you, if you said to someone, you 
are preaching a false gospel. You are a false teacher. Your gospel needs to be anathematized. It's pretty strong, right? It's what Paul said. Uh, it's what Russell Fuller said. Pretty strong stuff. If instead you said, you're just being pragmatic. You're going along to get along. Uh, you, you know, you're trying to get the best outcome from the situation, but you know, you're, you're not seeing that you're having to compromise to, uh, for the, the ends that are justifying the means here, which, which makes, which has a worse motive attached to it. And when you have a combination of people who are pragmatic and then who are blatant false teachers giving, and they're getting a pass, who do you focus on? Well, you can focus on both, but you can't ignore one to the, you can't make it all about one thing. And what I saw with a lot of conservatives, they didn't want to fight the false teacher thing. They didn't want to go there. They're, they're always good brothers. Jarvis Williams, Matt Hall, you know, Walter Strickland, they grew good brothers, even though blatantly heretical things. I, read about it. Where's my book? I have it here somewhere. Christianity and Social Justice, Religions and Conflict. I catalog it. False gospel. They're good brothers. Uh, sometimes it, it seemed maybe even getting more benefit of the doubt than quote unquote, a, a discernment blogger might get. And, and I am speaking a little broadly here. I do have examples of specifics and I, I don't think it matters at this point. I, I'm just, this is for, th this is the autopsy. This is for other denominations and organizations that want to avoid this. Uh, and I'm just giving my thoughts for those who are interested. So this is my opinion, but that's, that was a fundamental error it should have been, this is a false gospel from the beginning. So that's one thing. The other thing uh, that conservatives were very comfortable fighting was complementarianism. And, and let me tell you how this went. I do think it's an issue. I've done podcasts on it. It's a sideshow. Okay. It's important. I'm not saying it's not important, but when you look at the big picture, What's being cranked out of the seminaries? What is quote unquote systemic to pick a word the social justice advocates like to use? Critical race theory, liberation theology perhaps linked to that, but it, it neo-Marxism of, of sorts and mostly operating along racial lines. This really could have been nailed a lot harder. This is what's being cranked out. And here are the examples of it. And we've done that on this podcast, chapter and verse. Here's where it's happening. Here's what they're doing. Some of that happened, uh, but it was uh, often a talking point. It, was, it wasn't, there, there was a hesitancy with conservatives who had any institutional clout, I think, on that issue for fear of being called a racist, possibly. Now, that, I'm getting into the motives here. I just know how terrifying that is for people. And especially during 2020 and even the time leading up to it. Complementarianism felt easier, I think, because there were specific passages where Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach. And you could say, I'm taking my sand on the scripture, the sufficiency of scripture. That's usually what you say. It's, it's a battle over the sufficiency of scripture, right? It's also a battle over inerrancy. If you, and if, I think if people really push the CRT thing, that's what they would find. That was a battle over inerrancy too, and re the foundation of revelation itself. Is there any objectivity? Can we even know? Did God communicate in such a way we can all c come together, study, understand? We don't have to be from some oppressed social location to give special knowledge. It was an attack on inerrancy. But it... I think a lot of conservatives, they wanted the talking points were pragmatism, sufficiency, and that was usually tied to complementarianism. We're complementarians because Paul was a complementarian. Here's how it went. Look, here's a church that has a female pastor and it's in the SBC. Here's the response from SBC elites every time. Well, that church is doing its own thing because it's we believe in the autonomy of the local church. So that church is autonomous. Who looks like the bully in that situation? It looks like the conservatives. And that's the way the left was able to frame it every time. The conservatives are bullies. They're going after this tiny little church. They're going after a girl, right? They're going to hit a girl. Look at the girl and look, she's crying. She's upset. 
look look how you know what they're doing and this is not something endorsed by us this isn't endorsed you're you're claiming that the SBC endorses this is a and they were able to straw man it they were able and I'm not saying the conservatives were wrong they were right but they could have very easily shown that in the very halls of power critical race theory was being pushed and and they could have easily shown how that undermined the uh, inerrancy of scripture and it undermined biblical ethics and it merged with a gospel to create a false gospel and it flatlined reality into ideology. And I point all these things out in my book, Christianity and Social Justice, Religion and the Conflicts. I talk about it on this podcast. They could have done all that. That's not really what happened though. It was very surface level and then complementarianism was where there were debates and fights and 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 it, that was a sideshow, in my opinion. Now, that'll probably be more important moving forward because as conservatives leave, that might be cranked out of the seminaries more and more. But it hasn't been, not to the point that critical race stuff has been. And, and I agree. The same people that were promoting that are going to promote feminism, promote Me Too. Promote, they, I, I agree. It's all connected. But it was very easy to deflect and to show that this wasn't endorsed by the organization, the denomination as a whole. It was some rogue churches. So the, this was the ground the conservatives chose to fight on, and it wasn't, it was ground that they ended up having to be defensive on in some ways, and it was ground that just, it wasn't very strong. The other thing, um, and I'm going over negative now, I guess, but the other thing is we were pretty leaderless for in a, when I was part of the SBC, but even after that, and I was working to help people who, uh, trying to help people who, uh, wanted to take the denomination back for orthodoxy there there weren't a lot of leaders like I, I i know there were people who were conservative within the denomination i get that but uh i'm talking let me give you an example i if you go back look study the conservative resurgence adrian rogers page patterson and you know, what they did very firm very direct very aggressive against the error uh issue this is what i could have seen happening issue ultimatums when those aren't met issue deadlines give people a very clear direction of where you're heading and where they need to be going and if things aren't met you're going to leave an exit use leverage the all you have are the layman you don't have any institutional clout leverage the layman there i know this for a fact and i i, I wish i could share more i'm not but i know for a fact one of the strategies that conservatives try to do was they, they I think they overestimated their institutional uh, influence. I don't think they realized how bad it was. I think some of them do now. But there there was, and I'm not blaming anyone for ignorance, uh, but I'm just saying there, there was, it was leaderless. There, you didn't have strong leaders like that sticking together and it, it was, uh, it was, it was not that. It wasn't, I don't know how else to say it, but um, a lot of timidity, uh, a lot of trying to choose the ground in a way that was more favorable, but it wasn't. It was weaker, just weaker ground. And and then trying to do the political game without leveraging the most support, without really inspiring, ins inspirational people and and speaking the, the there was no populist kind of uprising there was no way to speak the language of the people in the pews i didn't see it it was nerdy things it, it was it was complementarian like laymen aren't going to sit there for a discussion about that they they will respond when um they will respond when you talk to them about how the gospel that they love and the the person who died for them, Jesus Christ, to pay for their sins is being uh, tarnished and their money is going towards uh, the, basically, the, the uh, tearing asunder of the Bible that they love. You, you got to go to the heart of what these people in the pews care about and what they think that they're funding they, without putting them to sleep. And I just don't see that that really happened. So this, this window closed, and I think this uh, Josh Bice exiting is just, it's further evidence that the window is closed. And I know that people will disagree with me. We can't let the SBC go. There's a lot of money there. I, I know, but 
we have to deal with reality too. And we can't keep funding something. People can't keep funding something that uh, is going to continue to work towards their own demise. So, um, so that's some of the negative. I think we, the window was missed. I think there was a lack of leadership. There was a vacuum there. Um, I think um, there was a lack of resources uh, that were produced about this. A lot of wasted, you know, whatever resources were used, many of them were probably wasted. Let me say some good things though, okay? Some encouragement here. Uh, I think it's good that some people are moving out. I think it's good what Josh Bice did, and I want to give him credit right now for doing this. It's not an easy thing. It was a lot less easy years ago. It's easier now, but it's still not easy. I was looking at, um, I saw something. This is from Josh Bice three years ago. And uh, it's, well, I'll, just, I'll just show you. It's a link someone sent me. Um, so you can pull it up here. It's from the Bible Thumping Wingnut uh, website, and it's in a uh, it's in a post called "David Platt Despised Being at the G3 Conference." And I, I get it's a very short post. It's uh, a guy who works for G3 named Fred Butler. I guess had made an observation about G3, and uh, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the post because it's really irrelevant. And this is old old news. The the thing that's relevant to me is. Um, Josh Bice is three years ago, uh, so this would have been, I guess, the G3 2019, was pretty defensive. Um, and, you know, these men, David Platt uh, included in that, Mark Dever, John Piper, they're not heretics. Um, he disagrees with their social justice positions, but he does not believe it to be sinful to insist, uh, let's see, to, to put them, it, they're not heresy. He thinks it's sinful to place them in that camp. Uh, Anyway, he goes on about this, okay? He defends Platt, Dever, and Piper to some extent. While he disagrees with their social justice, you know, they can speak at the conference. I want you to contrast that as three years ago with what Josh Bice is saying now and how social justice is a false gospel. This is improvement. This is, you know, hopefully what this is, is it's a learning. It's seeing. But it took, it took time. And, and I think many people have gone through the same transformation. Uh, you, you did have churches. You had, um, since we're on the Bible Thumping Wingnut page, uh, you had J.D. Hall's church uh, uh, in Montana. Um, they, they had left, I don't know, three, four years ago, something like that, over the same issues, pretty much, <laughs> social justice. I, I asked this, you know, I asked J.D. Hall when he came on my show a while back, because I said, how did you see it so early? How, how? And he said, oh, I was political minded, I think that might be part of it. And I could see how Marxists are subversive. I, so th there may be something to that. Uh, I don't know that I even have the full answer. It's something that I'm still curious about. I started seeing it in 2017, like fully, I started seeing it. Um, I started noticing it, if you watch the podcast from earlier this week and last week, I started noticing it as early as 2014. Uh, but it was in 2017 when I thought this is a religion and this has actually captured the school as far as, not that everyone's on board with it, but that this is being cranked out by the, the institution itself, the administration's on board. And I knew not everyone could see it at the time. After MLK 50 and T4G, I, do, I don't know. I don't know what to say after that. It, it was obvious, I think, at that point. But some people were slower to realize than others. And I understand, and I have grace for that. I get it. I think there's a lot of hindsight's 2020, looking back, thinking we could have done better. Uh, maybe Josh Bice thinks that. Maybe some of the Dallas signers think that. They um, you know, put together this document and wanted to hedge against it and then, you know, there, th th that was probably the, the biggest resistance, perhaps, uh, that took place within the window that I'm talking about. There wasn't a lot after that. And, and, and I mean, there was things here or there. I'm not saying there was nothing. You had, but you had, you know, kind of Founders Ministries doing its thing. You had kind of G3 doing its thing. CBN kind of rose up. Each one had different pieces of the pie. Like, 
For instance, I just mentioned that uh, G3 caters to more 1689, reform, Calvinist. Uh, CBN's broader than that. CBN is like, hey, if you're in the SBC, join us. You could be Arminian, you, could, you know, just join us. And a lot more of a big tent. But uh, they don't have the infrastructure. They don't have all the events. They don't have the resources. They, so more of just a loose affiliation. You have, so you, you have these different, and, and there's more than even that, but you have these different organizations kind of doing their own thing. There wasn't, there wasn't a big united front. And I know many wanted that. Um, but the thing is, I think now things have changed. And God in his, has perfect timing. We, we can live in regret all we want. I think it's helpful to go over some of this just, just for other organizations, for other people to just realize maybe some of the mistakes that might have been made. But that being said, God's timing is perfect. And where people are now who see it, especially after 2020, they see it. They know the battle's coming. The, the battle right now is who's the head of the church? Is it Caesar? Is it Uncle Sam? Is it God? Is it Jesus Christ? The battles for the church right now, can we trust the word of God? Or do we need some oppressed lens to figure it out? Because we can't trust uh, we can't trust ourselves to read it because we're coming from a bad social location or something like that. Uh, is, you know, is the church, what is the church? Is, is the church a good thing? In history, is it is this the way that God uh, forwards the Great Commission, or is it this oppressive, horrible, evil thing? And it wasn't until two seconds ago we figured that out. I think those on board with ripping down all you know of America's monuments, including those to great Christian men, including conservatives who won't lift a finger to stop it, their their silence is speaking. I mean, there, there's a lot of battles, but they're, they're lining up under this social justice movement. And I think people now are realizing this is where the battle is. It was confusion for a while. People didn't want to believe these things. And now they're realizing, I've got to leave this denomination. People that maybe I even used to defend, I can't defend them anymore. It's not, and it's not like their teaching, David Platt's teaching did not change significantly. He was... In fact, I only used his two famous 2018 sermon at T4G to show that this guy's a false teacher. Just look at this sermon, you know, and we could look at other things, but look at this sermon, you know, it was known. It's not that a lot changed, it's that I think we changed. Conservative fundam fundamentalist is the way the, the, uh, the leftists want to call people like us, I guess. Uh, but hey, historic fundamentalism, if you understand what that means, R.A. Tories, the fundamentals, uh, you know, if you're talking about theological fundamentalism, there's no problem with that. If you're talking about the separatism and, and these kinds of things, you know, maybe there's a, you know, there's a problem perhaps, but we're talking about what the word was intended to mean from the beginning. I have no problem with that. Sure, I believe that. I believe in the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Anyway, <laughs> it's helpful to to look at the autopsy, but it's encouraging, even knowing that maybe this battle failed in a temp in the temporal realm, not in the eternal realm. God God's plan never fails, and His timing's perfect. And we know that it, it what's happening right now is in within His plan. People realizing now who didn't realize before. People waking up to what's happening now. People understanding the working issues theologically. All of that. It's happening, and it's happening more and more and more, and the Lord is using people. He's using Josh Bice with, with this, even now. People who probably believe what he believed uh, in you know three years ago about David Platt and stuff. I don't think they believe that anymore. Um, he's using even people that don't get along with each other, <laughs> uh, that uh, you know are against the social justice, but they don't like each other. He's using them in, in their separate little areas. Uh, I think... One of the things that could be concerning, but I actually want to present it to you as a hopeful thing, is how decentralized everything is right now. You have new affiliations forming, new cooperations, and then a whole lot of people that are just independent churches. And you know what? It's a lot harder to steer independent churches towards error. Uh, now, it's easier in one sense, right? If you get one charismatic leader that goes in there, they can create a lot of damage. But I'm saying... Um, if you, let's say you have 10 
you know, good, solid churches. And you would need 10 false teachers, right, going into each one. Whereas in a denomination, you need one guy at the, the head and he can, he can do a lot of damage. And so uh, the local church autonomy, these organizations that are smaller, uh, more of a, hopefully a localist approach, a think local and act local, I'm all for that. I really think in your local community, don't see yourself as, as a Southern Baptist or a Presbyterian. You know, I'm a Christian living in this region. And, uh, and, and maybe it is the Baptist in that area, but I get these are the people that I'm getting together with because we want to reach the tangible, real people in our backyard and serve them. And that is, if we return to that, which I suspect we're going towards that in some ways, that can be a really good thing and the best resistance against what's coming. And if you would have, if you rewound the clock and you did everything differently and you had some strong leaders and they issued ultimatums and they retook the convention, they inspired the base and they fought the ground on, on you know, right where they should have and, and all of that. And they retook the SBC. How many years would it have been before the SBC drifted left again? It didn't take long after the conservative resurgence. So my only point in all this is God has a plan. We don't know. We don't know what alternative histories would have been like. But what just happened with, uh, with, with different pastors leaving the SBC at different time periods and forming their own things or being just a local church, uh, God has a purpose in this. And uh, it was not all in vain. It was not all in vain. Uh, it's because the battle is for hearts and minds. It's not for denominations and organizations and political posturing and image and fashion. It's not for that. It's for hearts and minds. If you stay focused on that, then I think life is a lot easier. And guess what? I think it's a lot less stressful. You think uh, someone like a Josh Bice is less stressed? <laughs> he doesn't have to deal with all the uh, ridiculousness of the SBC anymore. He's out. I mean, th there's, there's less stress and you can focus more on things that actually matter. So that's uh, something that I think is inspiring. And I hope others follow that uh, example. Hope this was helpful for you all. God bless. And by the way, I should mention, next uh, tomorrow's episode is a blockbuster. You're going to want to watch it, okay? Um, I don't know how long it's going to be on YouTube, but you're going to want to watch it. And uh, you can go see it on Rumble if it, it disappears. So God bless.